Reginald, thank you so much for being here today. Happy anniversary. Thank you, thank you. Very happy to be here. Hard to believe House Party turns 30 years old today. Where does the time go? It's scary because 30 is the age of a grown ass person. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's now officially a grown ass movie. Yeah, exactly. It's, it is a grown ass movie. It can it, it, it can drink. It can just do all kinds of. Things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, House Party was your debut, both as a writer and director. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about the origins of the whole project. I know. I think it was adapted from a short film you did in college. Yeah, uh, my senior thesis. You know. Uh, this, I went to Harvard as an undergrad mm -hmm. uh, in their film program, and it was very documentary oriented. And our year, we all said, nah, we're not doing that. We're going to do scripted movies. And a bunch of us did that. And I think they changed the rules so that would never happen again. Mm -hmm. But that year, um, I, I made this short film, and I spent all summer working on a script uh, and then I was packing to go back to college, and the radio was on, and the Luther Vandross song, Bad Boy Having a Party, was on. And at the time, I would do this kind of exercise where I would make up music videos in my head. Mm -hmm. So as I'm packing, I'm making up this video, and I'm like, wow, that'd be a cool video. Then I was like, that could be a movie. And that night, sitting inside the script that I had worked all summer on, I wrote a whole new script. And that was House Party. So it just kind of like, boom. Yeah, just, I, I love it. I love when you can trace back the idea for what would ultimately become a classic to one moment in time like that. It wasn't something that sort of brewed over the years. It, it, was, it was that moment in time. Well, I mean, the thing is, again, it's always, you've got to put in the 10,000 hours, right? Yeah. So when I was much younger, uh, my older brother was in college and I was always telling him my ideas for movies. Mm -hmm. So one Christmas, I opened my gift from him, and it's a book, and all the pages are blank. And he goes, stop telling me your ideas, write them down. So at that point, I started writing them down. And sometimes they weren't whole ideas. It was just like, something funny happened to me, or my friend, or, my, or, or you know, somebody in our family. So I had this book of little ideas. So when I made House Party, a lot of it was going back to that book and going, remember that time that crazy thing happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you know, and you start, you know, putting them together like a jigsaw puzzle. That short film made, that student film you made, is it, can you see it anywhere? Is it, is it out there? It is not. No. I, you Have know, you buried it? Have you buried it in the vault? Look, <laughs> I like it. I mean, I haven't seen it in 20 years, yeah. but I mean, it's a good movie, uh, but when we made the, you know, it, it's on 16 millimeters somewhere in a storage unit, mm -hmm. you know, and I just, when, when House Party happened as a movie, it was like, okay, now there's one scene that's better in the short film than the feature. What's that? There's a scene when the, when the, uh, the toilet stops up in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. For some reason, that original scene was really funny and even though the scene in the movie is really funny was it quite as funny as the original uh -huh. it's weird <laughs> i don't know why we we couldn't yeah. couldn't quite yeah. match it so at what point do you decide you're going to adapt the short film into a full-length feature well i was i would show my film uh at little screenings that were happening around new york city because mm -hmm. back then the whole black film scene hadn't exploded yet it was mm -hmm. everyone making little movies and um so there was a, a junior executive at New Line who saw the movie and brought it to her boss. And they were like, this is really cool. And at the time, New Line was famous for Nightmare on Elm Street. Mm -hmm. And they were like, look, well, maybe this is a way to find an, a new category for us besides doing horror. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have all these young people who see the horror movies. Maybe they would like to see this movie. So we developed the movie. And they actually had Will Smith under contract mm -hmm. because Will Smith had done a song, Nightmare on My Street. Yes, of course. And they sampled the movie. Mm -hmm. They didn't get permission. Mm -hmm. So Happened a lot in hip-hop back in the day. Happened a lot in hip-hop back in the day. Yeah. So as part of the legal settlement, um, they had to do a movie for New Line. So New Line's like, hey, we got these guys to star in it. And I was like, well, I love them. And that would have been Fresh Prince and yes. Jazzy Jeff. Yes. The thing was, I'm like, look, 
I don't want these guys to be in my movie because they lost a lawsuit, mm -hmm. right? And they'd be performing like this, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, right. I wanted them to be uh, hyped yeah, about yeah, it. Yes, yes. Um, Some bitterness. Attached. Yeah, I was like, no, yeah. they should be excited. So I went and talked to their manager at the time, who was Russell Simmons. Mm -hmm. Russell was like, oh, we're doing big deals in Hollywood. And I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> we'll just go on with our little movie. So I saw Kid and Play, mm -hmm. who had a couple of hot videos on Video Music Box, mm -hmm. which was the hot place to see hip hop videos at that time. Yeah. And I was like, man, the visually with the hair and the outfits and the dance, yeah. they were cool and two guys with two different looks, this is great. So I knew this uh, girl who worked at the management company. So I said, well, what are they like? Are they good guys? Do they show up on time? I said, oh yeah, they're great. So I said, what the heck? Let's meet with them and offer them the movie. So we did that, and it was a it was tricky for them because they had booked a big summer tour, and they're going to make a lot more money on the summer tour than they would being in our movie. Mm -hmm. I said, let me tell you something. I, I think long term the movie's going to be better for you, which turned out to be true. So they took the smaller money and did the movie. Wow. There are like three or four things you just mentioned in that explanation that I want to I want to get back to and unpack a little bit because there's a lot of information there. Yeah. Uh, but tell us about just going back to sort of this is the late '80s. It sounded like you know you were being fast tracked a little bit by Nuon Cinema. But what was your experience as an unproven filmmaker, late '80s, navigating Hollywood for the first time? I mean, what kind of obstacles did you did you face mm -hmm. trying to bring this to the big screen? Sure. Well, um, I had. You know, with the success of Spike Lee's first movie, She's Gotta Have It, there was an interest in black filmmakers. So there was there were opportunities kind of popping up. So I was meeting with different people, and I had written a spec script for House Party as a feature that I thought, well, push come to shove, I'll just do it independently out of my own pocket or whatever. Mm -hmm. but, I, but now that there were studios, I'm meeting with different studios, and they're all turning me down. And uh, one executive uh, at the studios, at one of the studios, uh, I think it was Paramount, mm -hmm. uh, who later I did a bunch of movies for. <laughs> but at the time, the executive said, look, there's two things that nobody wants to see. Yeah. Black movies and teen movies. You have a black teen movie. Like, no one wants to see that. So I was like, okay. Huh. So you get all these passes, and finally you get to New Line, which was a small, kind of the last stop on the train, right? Mm -hmm. And they were open. And there's, there's, there's something really important about those kind of places that are willing to try different things and be that last stop on the train because sometimes those are where the good innovative ideas are. So they embraced the movie and they, they gave me a bunch of notes and I said, no, 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 this is not a movie about a famous rapper. Mm -hmm. This is a movie about kids who like rap. <laughs> you know, and I, you know, they had been break in and stuff like that, yep. which are movies about show business in one way or another. Mm -hmm. I just want to make it about kids, and they were part of the hip hop culture, and that hadn't been done, and that's the movie I wanted to see, mm -hmm. and turned out that everybody wanted to see it. It always felt to me like almost like Animal House with like a hip hop twist. Also, the fact, I mean, no disrespect to the Paramount exec, but there were. There was an explosion of those teen movies directed by John Hughes in the yeah. 80s, uh, and they were all, uh, I think you could say, predominantly white. Yeah. Um, was this, in, in a way, sort of a reaction to those films? Well, look, I, I mean, when I saw American Graffiti for the first time, mm -hmm. blew my mind. When I saw Risky Business, when I saw Animal House, I loved those movies. And, I, and yes, those movies were pretty much all, all white. And I was like, that's fine. You do that. I'll cover my side of the street. I want to tell, you know, those same stories, which are very universal, mm -hmm. but from my cultural perspective. Mm -hmm. So that was my goal. And, you know, with House Party, we got to do that. And the same way I could watch a John Hughes movie and get it and relate to it, turns out that the same was true for House Party. Mm -hmm. But that had never been done before. That had never been proven before. Right. Roger Ebert wrote at the time that the House Party shows black teenagers uh, with a freshness and originality that's rare in modern movies. Um, I, I, I have to imagine that was 
part of your, your aspirations to broaden the depiction of young black people on screen. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, you know, a lot of people talk about positive or negative images. Mm -hmm. I wasn't interested in that. I was just interested in people being people. Mm -hmm. Just three-dimensional people. <laughs> You're like, here's this person, here's what I like about them, here's their flaws. Do you relate to that or not? Mm -hmm. and, and and that's what House Party did. It made people go, oh yeah, these are just, you know, like my me and my friends. Mm -hmm. We gotta talk a little bit more about the, the Will Smith connection here. Yes, indeed. Were, were those guys ever actually, did you ever have a conversation with them about, about mm -hmm. it? Or was this was purely sort of behind the scenes between the studio and, and their manager? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I. You know, we were all, you know, young and broke living in New York and everyone knew Russell because, you know, Russell was at the center of this hurricane of pop culture. So, you know, I, you know, you talk to Russell and Russell says, not interested. Well, I mean, that's kind of it. Yeah. Now, years later, <laughs> you know, we're all, you know, in Hollywood together and, you know, I'd see Will Smith, who is the nicest, greatest guy oh, in the yeah. world. And... It was a great movie with Kid and Play. It would have been a great movie with Will Smith and Jazzy Jeff. And, you know, I still would love to work with Will at some point mm -hmm. in my career. But, you know, this is what happens. Yeah. It was it was meant to be the way we made it. Yeah. And Chris Reed, funnily enough, a.k.a. Kid, mm -hmm. has said that they actually, Kid and Play, turned down an NBC sitcom that went on to become The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. So it's almost like they swapped roles. It's kind of, it's kind of a, a amazing Hollywood lore. Right, uh, right. And, 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 and that is Hollywood all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. uh, people, people fall in out of things. Yeah, things, things happen and don't happen. And it's okay. You know, the point is just, you know, keep working, keep doing your best. Yeah. But was that always part of your ambition to have hip hop artists in these roles? Because you went from, from, you know, Will and Jeff to, to Kid and Play. Well, we needed stars, yeah. right? You you want to say to the studio, well, these people have a fan base that will show up. And at the time, they really weren't uh, a lot of young black actors who you could say, oh, they have a hit TV show or they were starring in such and such a movie. Mm -hmm. So you really had to turn to the music world to find people who had a fan base. Mm -hmm. So we had, you know, Kid and Play, we had Full Force, you know, and Martin at the time, he'd had a small role in Do the Right Thing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Robin Harris, again, had a bigger, uh, more impactful role in, in Do the Right Thing. Johnny Witherspoon wasn't famous, but he was certainly in my eyes a legend from working with Richard Pryor and all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So we had enough of a cast that mattered to the audience we were speaking to. Mm -hmm. And if they responded and they showed up, then everyone else would show up. Kid and Play was huge at the time. I don't want to underplay that. Everybody was rolling with Kid and Play. They, yeah. they had all the hype. Yes. Uh, but I mean, what kind of advantage is that to, to bring in two guys who already have that working relationship, or already a creative tandem uh, in, into a project like this? Well, it was everything because, you know, they didn't have to build chemistry together, they had it. The same with Tisha and AJ. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, you know, uh, they were friends. And they were like, hey, let's go audition for this movie. And, you know, the truth is, Tisha had more movie experience than all of us. She was in Little Shop of Horrors. You know, she actually, uh, she was in, in School Days. The rest of us, this was everyone's first big break. Mm -hmm. So we're all like, just, you know, all adrenaline and enthusiasm. Tisha, uh, of course, went on to star in Martin, opposite Martin Lawrence. Was, yeah. this, was this where Martin and Gina met for the first time? This is where they met for the first time. Yeah. And then I cast them both in Boomerang, uh, the right. movie I did with Eddie Murphy. Yeah. And as we were making Boomerang, I kept talking about how much I love Martin and I just want to do more projects with him and I got to find another vehicle for him. And then I would also say that about Tisha, like Tisha's so great, got to find another project to do with Tisha. So finally Eddie, in the wisdom that is Eddie Murphy, goes, mm -hmm. well, why don't you just do a movie with them together? I was like, that's a good idea. <laughs> now the whole time Martin Lawrence is hearing me and Eddie talk about him and Tisha. Mm -hmm. And Martin, 
who was developing the sitcom was like, well, if Reggie and Eddie think, you know, Tisha and I are a good pair, then I'm going to take that idea and use it on my show. And it turns out it was a good idea. It was a very good idea. <laughs> Did you at least get a thank you credit on that? <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't need it. Look, I'm just, look, Martin is one of the greatest sitcoms mm -hmm. uh, ever. It's so funny. It's so legendary. Those characters that he created lived on, and that's the beauty of it. Like, we all help each other. We all do that thing. So, again, it's just a matter of, like, when do I get to work with Martin again? And Martin was plays is plays cousin. Is that is that correct? They have some relation. Yeah, they have some relation. The other thing that was crazy is that Martin spent a summer working at Sears, okay, with uh, Salt and Pepper, and <laughs> Salt and Pepper and Kid and Play were managed by the same guy, and I so, think they danced for them. Right? Yes, and they were backup dancers. For salt and pepper. Right. So the fact that they were all working in Sears in Queens one summer, I mean, that's a show. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just say that. That yeah. like, what was that every day? Did yeah. any work get done? Did you <laughs> sell any Kenmore washers? I I, I want to know. Tell me some of your your favorite memories from the set of this film. Well, probably the greatest moment had to be when we were shooting the dance. Oh number. yeah. Um, I love musicals from Singing in the Rain to Jesus Christ Superstar, all that kind of stuff. So, and this movie was always kind of a backdoor musical, you know? I, I mean, there's really not breaking in the song except for the very end when, when Kid's in jail. But the dance number was so perfect because Kid and Play are great dancers, Tisha and AJ are great dancers. So it was like, well, we've got to have a dance battle. And the thing is, it's it's beautifully choreographed by each by each team, but it's not fake. It's not fantastical, right? Mm -hmm. It's in the in the world of things you can actually see at a party. Um, so we're shooting it, and it's just so much fun. The music is banging. The whole room is just rocking. The the whole soundstage. And I remember our Steadicam operator, Kirk. Uh, Kirk Gartner was awesome, and he was one of the dancers. He was just right there in there with them. When they would drop low, he would drop low. I think at one point, he just spun and did a 360. He actually filmed off set, because he was just so in the moment of dancing. Yeah. And I just remember going, this is the best day of my life. <laughs> We're having so much fun. Oh my God. Yeah. And because, I mean, normally just shooting a number like that, that would be a day's work. Mm -hmm. But it was like, no, 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 we only have 30 days to make this thing. Uh, we got to move on. Yeah. So even though we shot it and shot it and we shot some extra stuff just because we were all having fun. It was like, okay, now let's move on. Yeah, I was going to ask you if, if, you know, making a film about a house party, set at a house party, um, it was your first film and you, you didn't have other features to compare it to, mm -hmm. but uh, was a little more fun than your average production you, you know if people were actually getting funky on the set or if it was strictly business but it sounds like there was there was some fun to be had oh it was definitely fun and you know uh there was a kid uh irv dotton who was in one of my student movies uh back in boston and i don't know how he did it but somehow he got to los angeles so by the time we were shooting on the sound sites get ready to shoot the party stuff he was there on the lot i'm like how don't you get to LA, get on the lot, mm -hmm. and he goes, when do we start? I go, tomorrow, because if you got this far, you definitely got gonna, the job. Yeah, yeah. and it was- Worked for it. Yeah, and the thing is, so everyone's hanging out, everyone's making friends, there are people dating, you know? It was a whole scene, mm -hmm. you know, of like, you know, kids from different schools in LA, and they're all there, we're all shooting a house party. Was it actually shot at Play's house? Is that true? No. It was not. Well, I mean, here's the thing. It was, I mean, Kim Play lived in New York. Okay. We shot the movie in LA. Mm -hmm. So the exterior was a, a house in LA, um, of the exterior of the house. Mm -hmm. The inside of the house was on a soundstage at, at the, you know, at the same sound stages where they shot Gone with the Wind. And and then it's we amazing. shot some stuff out in Monrovia, like out kind of in the real 
uh, suburbs, right, mm -hmm. uh, in the valley. But I really wanted it to look like America. Mm -hmm. You know, where whether you lived in New York or Queens or L.A. or Atlanta, you would imagine this is exactly like the parties we have. Mm -hmm. And that what was great. I remember one reviewer in New York was like, this is a very New York movie. I don't know if other people are going to get it because this is clearly shot in New York with all New York people. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm like, glad yes, you feel it. that way. We and, fooled them. Right. And I'd never mentioned what city he was in because it was, this was America. This was mm -hmm. all of us. Mm -hmm. Um, and, 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 and it worked. It resonated with the whole country. Mm -hmm. And I remember by the time the movie got put on home video, there was this guy who owned a video store in Orange County. And he goes, don't let anyone tell you that white kids aren't watching this movie because I can't keep it in stock. Mm -hmm. It's always rented because everybody loves it. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh. There you go. I was a white kid renting that movie. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. I, 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 I found out. I mean, look. I mean, today is you know the anniversary, and I got this, I got this text from this guy in Ireland going, "That movie changed my life," and I'm like, "This is great." Yeah. It just connects yeah. with everybody. It also arrived at a time where hip hop was really moving into the mainstream. Yes. Um, I mean, how much do you think House Party contributed to that? Well, it was a very big deal overcoming a lot of uh, prejudice about hip hop, right? Mm -hmm. I remember there was a theater in Colorado who wouldn't turn the lights all the way down because they thought, well, if it's too dark in the theater, there's going to be a riot. It's like, and you know, when you talk to young people today about House Party, they're like, it's so not that. Mm -hmm. They can't imagine people's having that mentality about that film, mm -hmm. but that's how new hip hop was in terms of breaking into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the Siskel and Ebert review. I remember Ebert loved the movie and Siskel didn't. Siskel's like, these are a bunch of juvenile delinquents and they're marking up buildings. And it's like, no. That's why I always liked Ebert better. This is the thing. <laughs> this is the thing. Bless them both, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Ebert. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Come on. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, so that's the thing. It really broke a lot of barriers for people mm -hmm. because it showed, you know, hip hop fans, hip hop creators as people just like anybody else. Mm -hmm. And within the context of, of hip hop history, it arrived sort of in the epicenter of, of what they call the golden age. Do you, do you subscribe to the theory that there was a, a golden age of hip hop? Um, I I think there are three great periods of hip hop. Okay. That's one of them. Mm -hmm. And that was the period of happy rap. Mm -hmm. And that's a Bernie Mac phrase that I really love because there was a time where it was really just party music. Mm -hmm. And it's you know hip hop as party music is really underrated. You know whether you're talking about Kid and Play mm -hmm. or Heavy D or the Funky 4 Plus 1, I mean those were that's great music and great songs that I think uh, doesn't get enough shine mm -hmm. as a great period in hip hop. Then there was that period in the early 90s, which is Trap Call Quest, mm -hmm. Ice Cube, Public Enemy, mm -hmm. you know, Eric B. Rick Kim, Like, there was like a summer where a masterpiece was dropped. 19, every 1993. Week. Yes. Uh, Midnight Marauders and Enter the 36 Chambers came out in the same this day. That's what I'm saying. I mean, it's definitive. It was just, the, the, so that. I mean, if you want to say the peak peak, one could successfully argue that was the true peak, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, I've got to tell you, the late 90s, early aughts, you know, once hip hop truly became like a national music and, you know, Atlanta's kicking in, LA's kicking mm -hmm. in, and it became a much bigger conversation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Dre's doing his thing and the South finds its voice with Outkast yep. and, yep. you know, Ludacris and all that. And that was an amazing era. I mean, the, this movie I'm working on now is set in 2006. And just reviewing all the music from that era, it's incredible. Incredible. Yeah, that was the rise of Kanye. Right. The Neptunes were really coming out then. This is what I'm saying. Out, then. Organized noise. There's all yeah. this. So I would, I, I can point to three different periods where hip hop was just had an incredible commercial and artistic peak. 
Mm -hmm. um, and very happy to be, you know, living and working in all of them. You know, it's funny. I feel like you can, tra the, the phases that you just listed, I feel like you can trace over the course of De La Soul's career specifically. Yeah. Because their first album was that happy party rap. And I think 91 maybe was like all of a sudden De La Soul was dead. And that was like sort of marked sort of the transition into that into right. the early I, 90s. Album. An even bigger transition album was Stakes is High. Yes, for right? sure. Because to me, Got it, gloomy. it was the first adult hip hop album where they talked about adult things. They talked about being a parent, and they talked about all this stuff, mm -hmm. and they also introduced Most Deaf and Common on that album. Mm -hmm. Just think about that. Yeah. Two giant artists in their own right who yeah. were you know, doing guest appearances throughout that album. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, the movie did have. I, I could talk about hip hop all day, but we got. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got to talk could, some more house. Exactly. We got to talk about some we're, more house we're in party. We're a bad hole right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we um, can spit out. <laughs> uh, beyond, beyond the fun loving aspects to it all, I, house party did have some strong social messages. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what were you trying to con convey on that front? Well, it's very funny because I really wanted to make a movie that hate, had the safe sex message. Mm -hmm. But if there's anything I hate is movies that are too on the nose with their, you know, uh, with their uh, message. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's that great running gag in Don't Drink Your Drink. I was just thinking about message. that message. <laughs> yes. That's Keenan Wayans' yep. underrated genius. Yep. And we love him. He's still underrated. Yep. But that was one of the all-time great jokes. Mm -hmm. So my thing was, look, you've got to bury it in so deep in the fun that no one thinks they're being preached to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're two thirds into the movie, you're having fun, it's a party, and then he's finally alone with, with Tisha, and he doesn't have a condom, because uh, the condom's been in his wallet for so long <laughs> that it's just melted and no good. And he doesn't have sex with her. Mm -hmm. And then we move on, back to the fun, right? Just keep it moving, mm -hmm. don't, don't go, you know, don't look to the camera. And go. Mm -hmm. uh, so. A year later, this uh, health organization in New Jersey gave us an award for that safe sex message. Wow. So we're there at the event, and I go, this is really nice, and I really appreciate this, but I mean, come on. Did the movie really make a difference? He goes, no, Reggie, I I'm, I'm a doctor at this clinic, and kids would come in and ask for condoms, and they would reference your movie. So I can tell you, as a guy on the front lines of this kind of, you know, sexual health war, your movie made a huge positive difference to the community. And I was like, oh my God, it worked. It's amazing. It was really wonderful. And it just encouraged me that you can, you can have it all. You can really entertain people and you can sneak in some good ideas. And it felt like one of the realest moments in the film. I, I think every teenager in the 1990s related specifically to that moment. Right. The message was, have more than one condo. <laughs> exactly. And maybe don't leave it in the wallet every day, every sweaty, hot day yep. sitting on the bus. Yep. yep. Maybe switch it up. Yep. What was your relationship? <laughs> What was your relationship like with house, house parties after the fact? This this was a huge commercial and critical success. Um, are you are you then like the king of house parties in Los Angeles? Did you have to throw good parties after putting this movie out there? I did not. No. Because that felt like, whoa, how am I going to live up to that? People are going <laughs> to want a level of cinematic experience that I was not prepared to deliver. Mm -hmm. Again, I was the, I was the witness of the part. I, w I was more kid than play. Mm -hmm. Like, play is the guy who's, you know, he's the party giver. Like, I'm the nerdy guy who appreciates cool people and mm -hmm. could, like, write it all down and capture it. Did you get invited to more house parties after you made this movie? The nicest house party, there's, there's two, uh, invitations I got mm -hmm. from um, uh, amazing uh, actors who were fans of the movie. Rashida Jones does an annual pajama jam, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because she loved House Party so much. And then uh, Nafisa Williams, who's on Black Lightning, I was down in Atlanta. She goes, oh, you can be here for my annual uh, House Party party. 
And I was like, oh my God. And they were like, oh yeah, your movie's everything. Yep. So it was great to be at those parties with wonderful actors who I respect so much, who, you know, love my movie. Mm -hmm. The movie led to four sequels. Yes. Uh, which I think is, is a surprise to a lot of people. I mean, I, the first couple, I think, released theatrically, mm -hmm. the second two more quietly. Mm -hmm. But what you weren't directly involved, but what, no. is, what is your relationship with the sequels? I get a check. <laughs> Every year I open the mailbox and there's uh -huh. a check. You go, yes. <laughs> and here's the thing, what's interesting is all the sequels have been successful, but none of them has made as much as the first movie. Mm -hmm. So, and I kind of warned them because I, I, told, uh, I told the studio, I was like, look, there's rules to this. I know it doesn't look like there's rules, but there's rules to why this thing worked. They're like, ah, we got it. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> and that's the thing. The sequels don't follow the rules. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I know they're they're planning one now, so I, I wish them luck. Yeah. But Well, you if know. you were to boil those down, what would be what would be the essential rules? Well, I mean, it's funny cuz the the rules aren't just for house party. It's mm -hmm. it's for almost every movie I make, mm -hmm. which is that um, you know, the black community is not monolithic. And you kind of want to see every group. Mm -hmm. You want to see people live in the projects. You want to see people living in a kind of regular house. You want to see people living in a house with a you know rose garden and a, and a white picket fence. Mm -hmm. And they all hang out. Same is true with Boomerang. You have Eddie, Martin, David Anna Greer. Most guys are like, I'm one of those three guys, mm -hmm. right? But you look at it and you go, yeah, that's me and my friends. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just show they show the real reality of you and your friends, and that goes a long way, you know? Show, again, Sydney and Shrane, two different types of girls, but they're really good friends. And like, not just the girls that you're chasing, but make them real characters. Mm -hmm. That was a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's still kind of a big deal, because most people don't do that. They just have a hot girl that they're chasing. It's like, well, what's that hot girl thinking? Mm -hmm. You know, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, people have parents. What's going on with them? <laughs> you know, right, right. so it just seems like, well, you're not saying anything, Reggie. But most people don't do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned the reboot. Yes. Uh, this is it reportedly in the works from LeBron James and his producing mm -hmm. partner, Maverick Carter. Mm -hmm. uh, have, you, have, have you been in touch with them at all? Or again, no, no, no relation to it? I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. Who do you want to see cast in it? I think that's a big question. Who's, who who oh. could possibly reboot House Party right now? I, you know, that's their job. You know, you're going to leave it to them? I, I look, yeah. I literally, I, I've got, a, I've got a, a movie I produce that's coming out the end of this month. Mm -hmm. I've got a movie I'm editing that'll come out in the fall of this year, and I've got Black Godfather, my documentary that's yeah. playing now on Netflix. So, like three movies in a year. You got I'm, enough on your plate. I'm pretty good. <laughs> pretty yeah. good. Yeah. They'll they'll, they'll handle yeah. that fine. Yeah. Well, finally, I mean, just in general, how would you say, looking back on the whole experience, uh, the whole phenomenon that this movie this movie was? I mean, how did this change your life? How did this change your career? It changed everything. You know, because it's a miracle to get a movie made. But to have a movie that uh, was one of the most profitable movies of that decade, mm. I mean, that's a great thing to be able to say. To have a movie that continues from generation to generation, continues to be relevant now. Folks who grew up with the movie are showing their kids. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, the dance scene uh, on social media just keeps living you know, God bless Johnny Witherspoon and Robin Harris, who are not with us, but mm -hmm. those jokes, people keep joking about public enema, and you follow the drip. I mean, you know, there's all these great lines that that live on. So because of that, I, I had offers from every studio in Hollywood. Everyone who had turned down House Party said, we want the next yeah. one. <laughs> and, you know, that next year I made you know, Boomerang with Eddie Murphy and Halle Berry and all those folks. And then I also made Bebe's Kids, you know, my tribute to Robin oh, Harris, nice, yeah. who we passed, and we were going to make a live action movie with him. We said, well, let's do it animated. Let's keep Robin Harris' memory alive. So, you know, instantly everything changed. Mm -hmm. And and here I am talking to you right now. Yeah. 30 years later, people 30 still like later. it. 
so good to talk to you about this. Same. That was a, that was a blast. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. All right.